We're going to tell a few histories of the field of cognitive science. And I say a few histories because, as we'll see, cognitive science draws on many different strands of, of knowledge, on philosophy and various scientific disciplines and more beyond. So there's not just one history. And what are they jointly concerned with? The word cognition is not self-explanatory. Um, it has the sense of knowing. Um, I'm sure you, you get that already. But making that more explicit is going to prove to be interestingly challenging. So if cognition is about knowing, then it is about the relationship between two things. One is the person or system or whatever is knowing, the knower, and the other is that which is known. Now you might think of this as the knower is yourself and what's known is the world, but both of those terms turn out to be problematic and indeed not independent of each other. Defining what we mean by the subject of knowledge is not easy. It's not simply a matter of um, identifying something which is inside somebody. Even saying where knowledge is or who has the knowledge turns out to be interestingly difficult. And this brings questions with it about what we mean by the world, the environment, are we talking about physical environments, social environments, um, cosmos, uh, or just the room around you? As we characterize knowing in different ways, so these notions are both in play. The notion of who is the subject of knowledge and what is the knowledge about. Um, so we've got lots to talk about. That's, I hope you'll agree, depressingly vague. Let's see if we can do a little better. Well, I've tried at various times to describe the subject of cognitive science as the exploration of the many links between such notions as minds, brains, and behavior. That seems like a bit more of a workmanlike definition. Maybe we could, you know, find out what are those relations between minds and brains, between brains and behavior, between minds and behavior. Um, what we'll see is that um, all three of those terms are difficult. It's not easy. Well, brains, we'll get into this, but no one of those three terms is easy. Uh, mind is going to be particularly difficult to characterize. And the word mind that we use now uh, is popular now, but if you go back even 200 years, people tended to use the word soul for that instead. And with that, you should get a sense that we're in, we're taking a peak at territory in which the long history of the co-development of particular kinds of society, of philosophy, and of religion have all gone together. So words like spirit, consciousness, intellect or intelligence, and soul and mind are always going to be contested. It's not that there's a simple object to study here, but rather what we're doing is we're trying to get scientific purchase on some ideas that have been um, of interest to a much, much broader set of people, by no means all scientists. So let's consider minds brains and behavior. Brains are probably the most complicated thing we know of in the entire universe. At least they seem that way to us. We have a view on that. We're human and we're particularly awestruck by our amazingly complex brains. Ants may not agree with us that our brains are um, in any way interesting, but from our point of view they're certainly interesting. Complicated, and they are obviously not going to be easy to figure out what this organ is doing, this lump of fatty meat. But we do have one good um, way of getting to grips with brains. We know where they are. Brains are inside skulls. We can find them. There's Every person has one brain. Um, so in that respect, they make an interesting object of study. It's very easy to make an object out of the brain. The notion of behavior is a tricky one. Defining a behavior is not a simple matter. Uh, 
And it's often treated within our society as if it were a simple matter, as if there were one way to describe what someone does. Each of these little drawings here is clearly made to illustrate a behaviour, whether it's scratching, playing two banjos at once, or doing the laundry. You could easily describe the thing depicted in each of these drawings as a behaviour. But these are drawings designed for that, designed to guide you towards one specific interpretation. If you observe any person at any given time, characterizing what they're doing is not an easy thing, and it's not possible only with reference to what you see. Let me give you an example. You know the children's book Winnie the Pooh. There's a character in there, Christopher Robin, and here he is. Imagine, if you will, the horror. Christopher Robin has killed his grandma and is now trying to bury her in the garden with a shovel. So I'll give you a bit of backstory to give this some context. We come across Christopher Robin and we could ask, well, what behavior is he exhibiting? And that's a clunky way of saying, what is he doing? But if I ask you, what is he doing? You could write me a whole novel on this. There's enough material there now to make an interesting story. But if I say, what behavior is he exhibiting? I'm suggesting that there's one single way to describe what he's doing. But look how many ways there are. He's um, pushing the spade with his leg. He's digging. He's breathing. He's burying a corpse. He's trying to get away with a crime. He's worrying. He's digesting. He's doing all kinds of things. And you could view the same person at the same time in many different ways. And as you choose one perspective or another, one way to view this person or another, so different behaviors will come into view. So in describing behavior, we cannot be simply objective. I hope that's not too startling. Care is needed. Because a description of behavior necessarily implies some sort of order, purpose to that activity, we have to recognize that the observer, we, the scientists, or the people trying to describe the behavior, choose to highlight some factors, to ignore others, to regard some motives, purposes as salient, and to ignore others, to pick out some suite of processes and ignore others. So he's clearly digesting, but you probably wouldn't put that in the description, in your most concise description of his behavior. Goals and purposes are not objective properties of the world. And when we describe things in those terms, we are ourselves partly responsible for whatever the product of such an observation is. So behavior is tricky. And brain's complicated, but reasonably, we, we can find them. We can make objects of them. Minds. Now, this one's going to be difficult. It may seem obvious to you, and it is obvious in our everyday discourse, that you have a mind, you are a minded being, we each have a mind, and we understand ourselves in these terms. But our everyday way of dealing with being in the world, of living our lives, doesn't mean that the terms in which we think about ourselves are going to become suitable objects for scientific study. So it's not clear immediately how to study minds or even how to talk about minds, and our everyday language may be misleading here. So here's a bunch of ways that we might talk about minds. You know, you say, make up your mind, put your mind at ease. You say, you see something in your mind's eye. Say something's going to blow your mind. Someone's got a one-track mind. As you can see, the sense of the term mind here is very different in each of these phrases. And that illustrates the point that there's no one thing that the word mind refers to. We use the word mind when we want to come at aspects of our being that include very subjective elements, very personal elements, but that does not in itself make a mind a thing. So a useful caution here is to avoid, or at least be self-conscious, of reification. Reification is a fancy word. It means taking something which is an abstract notion and only vaguely defined and treating it as if it was a well-defined object. So 
as we survey many, many accounts of mind and behavior, what we'll see is that there's a great deal of reification. Because in order to make any kind of secure, positive statement about something, you have to assume that that thing exists, of course. And there's a great hunger for such work. Many people want to know who they are. How, what's, the, what's the best way that I should understand myself or talk about me? And how do I work? And with that obvious human desire to, under, to, to see yourself as somehow rational, the question of how the mind works arises even before we've picked out something called a mind. So there's no shortage of theories and stories and ways of thinking about minds. But we need to be careful because there is no single thing that the word mind picks out. And when we treat of such matters in one way or another, we are reifying. So as I say, we may not um, be able to avoid reifying in the scientific context, but we need to be a little bit self-conscious about it. So that's getting, making everything very, very muddy indeed, isn't it?